Right, so today we're going to look at ecosystems and cold environments. Uh, near the end of the ecosystem section, after you've looked at the basic characteristics of an ecosystem, then you've looked at tropical rainforests, you're going to get a couple of questions on either hot deserts or cold environments. So you should have studied one of those and the same principles apply to either, either hot deserts or cold environments. So hopefully you've looked at the characteristics and climate of which, whichever one you looked at, biodiversity in that area and then also development opportunities and challenges. Now my groups have only looked at cold environments so that's what I'm going to concentrate on now. To start with when we're looking at cold environments we want to break down and look at the different climates that we see there. To start with let's look at Barrow in Alaska. The temperature is very inconsistent throughout the year and changes quite rapidly. We get highs of above freezing in July but then we get extreme lows almost towards minus 30 degrees. When we look at precipitation there's quite a variety throughout the year with August being the highest around about 30 millimeters of precipitation. In comparison when we look at McMurdo and Antarctica we see a different picture. The temperature doesn't get above freezing so the highs are around about minus four degrees whereas the lows go down towards again minus 25 degrees. The levels of precipitation in Antarctica are a lot lower and what we tend to see in polar environments is very little precipitation throughout the year. We also want to make a comparison between polar and tundra regions and pupils need to understand that there are a difference between these areas. When we look at polar regions they tend to be inland areas away from the warming influence of the sea. We've got examples such as Greenland, northern Canada, northern Russia and Antarctica. The average monthly temperature is below freezing and these are partly or completely covered by ice caps. In comparison when we look at tundra environments these occur in the northern hemisphere south of the ice caps. They take up a fifth of the earth's land surface and examples of these are Russia, Canada and Alaska. These areas lack permanent ice coverage but experience cold weather for most of the year. Some of the ground is permanently frozen and these areas are generally treeless so they therefore have low-lying shrubs and mosses. An important term when looking at these areas is the term permafrost. So in cold climates most of the ground is permanently frozen. Around a quarter of the Earth's surface is affected by continuous or sporadic permafrost but we also see waterlogged conditions during the summer when the uppermost layer melts. Biodiversity is generally low in cold environments. The common animal adaptions are thick furs, they are white to avoid predators and they have hooves to deal with soggy ground or ice. When looking at cold environments you need to have looked at a couple of case studies. I'm going to concentrate on Alaska. To start with we want to look at the development opportunities. The first big one is the oil industries. Now they could contribute 100,000 jobs and they also believe one in seven Alaskans are employed in the oil industry in some way. They also state that a third of the state's economy comes from the oil industries. The majority of the oil is transported on the Trans-Alaskan pipeline from the north of Alaska to the south of Alaska and this is due to oil tankers not being able to access the north because of frozen seas. Now some of the challenges include spills and damage to the environment and this is the biggest risk of mining drilling for oil. Some of the positives associated with the oil industry is the income, the jobs and the taxes and what they can contribute to society. A lot of the negatives include migrant workers only going there for certain times of year and not actually spending money in the local economy. There's also short term contracts so people aren't working in these industries and areas for very long but also local people don't get many of the jobs and they go to overseas workers. The last one is any oil spills which again could have a massive impact on the environment. Other development opportunities is energy so hydroelectric power is an area that can be used in Alaska. The fishing industry also contributes over 78,000 jobs and is worth six billion dollars to the economy. Mineral extraction also is a big business with gold, silver, zinc and lead being mined and tourism also has a big impact on the economy. We have one to two million tourists a year and 60% of these tourists come on cruise ships. When we look at development challenges, we're talking about how difficult it is actually to live there. 
So we've got the general cold climate, which is difficult to live in and survive in throughout the year. And also there is a reduction in sunlight because of the latitude. Alaska is also a difficult place to move around. So physically moving across the landscape is very difficult. And because of the weather and the snow and the melting of ice, it's very difficult to build roads. So it's a very inaccessible area. We also see great difficulty in the construction of buildings and infrastructure in Alaska. What commonly happens is when buildings are heated up, they melt the surrounding ice and snow. Therefore, we get an urban heat island. Now, this can lead to uneven ground and buildings shifting. Ways to get around that uneven ground is to build houses on stilts that can be adjusted, as well as insulating roads and pipes. Now, it's important we also recognize that we need to manage these areas and the wilderness. So the wilderness are areas of unspoiled and remote regions of the world. These areas need to be protected, uh, but over the last you know, few years, tourism has increased massively. It's really important to try and protect these areas for scientific study and to preserve the genetic diversity. Polar wildernesses help regulate global temperature and also the permafrost stores methane, which would also help with climate change. When we're looking at how to manage the areas of wilderness, we've got the Antarctic Treaty from 1961, the Protocol on the Environmental Protection to the Antarctica Treaty of 1998, which also includes 28 countries, and there are restrictions on any new activity in these areas. NGOs such as Greenpeace have also been involved in the protection of cold environments. That's just a quick outline of everything you need to know for cold environments. Thanks for watching. Make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to the channel for these videos into your feed every week. Next week, I'm gonna be doing a revision and recap session on ecosystems.